Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I wanted to echo everything that uh, Ty just said. Uh, a huge thank you to all the perfusionists and, and healthcare workers out there for doing such a, an amazing job during this uh, time of crisis. And a very special thank you to all of our loyal custodial, custodial community. We really appreciate you. We hope to see everybody here in person next year at this same time. So be safe and uh, take care of your families. And so with that, I'd like to start by uh, introducing my talk today. I'm gonna to be talking about myocardial protection and post bypass recovery. We're gonna talk about essential pharmaceuticals, um, custodial HTK and how it works. Take a look at the delivery protocol and the effects of hemodilution associated with bypass and then look at post bypass EMUF. So essential pharmaceuticals, who are we? Um, we have the exclusive distribution rights of custodial HTK in the US. Um, we've been serving the transplant community as well as um, the cardiac community since 2006 here in the United States. So custodial cardioplegia, let's start out there. This is, was developed by Dr. Brett Schneider and Professor Preuss. Um, this was developed in Germany in the early 70s. So this is not new technology, but it is, uh, it is tried and true. Um, when you look at a uh, bag of uh, custodial HTK, I like to break the components down into the top four as the uh, arresting components and the bottom four as the protecting components of the solution. And you'll notice that uh, these are in millimoles. And so that uh, if you dissect the millimoles in half, roughly you're looking at about seven milliequivalents of potassium in the solution. So very little potassium concentration, um, negligible calcium and uh, low potassium. And then the other components, the uh, histidine, tryptophan and ketoglutarate. Bill. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, you're not seeing, you're not seeing. No, we're not seeing yet. your slide presentation I'm or sorry. your PowerPoint. Let me get back here. It says share screen. I apologize, guys. Are you seeing this? Not yet, Bill. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Now we're seeing your hole there. Now. Gotcha. Okay. You're online. Gotcha. Sorry so about that. Uh, I am the uh, guinea pig for this whole process. And so here we are. Um, so taking a look at the components again, really quick there are the components. Um, as noted, the top four are the arresting components, and the bottom four are the protecting components. I'm going to breeze through that now. Um, it's an intracellular solution, as you're all very well aware, um, the low sodium, the low calcium. It, uh, it reduces the um, action potential. So reducing that sodium and calcium uh, level, um, the, you cannot generate enough positive ions to create that action potential. So therefore, the heart stays akinetic for as long as the solution is, is within the uh, myocardium. Um, so then we get on to the protecting uh, aspect of the components of custodial HTK. And we first look at histidine and histidine in my opinion is the uh, secret sauce to uh, why this is such an effective myocardial preservation solution. Histidine is an alpha amino acid. Uh, it does a great job of uh, protecting inflamed tissues by uh, scavenging oxygen reactive species and inhibit inhibit cytokines and growth factors that are involved in uh, tissue damage. But what does a really nice job of, if you can appreciate this graph here, is that you've got the pH here and the ischemia of the myocardia down here on this axis. And the top line is the custodial HTK, and the bottom line is your standard four to one St. Thomas blood cardioplegia. And at zero uh, of the myocardial ischemia, we start out at 7.4, we're all pretty much the same. But as soon as you start getting out to 30 minutes, at custodial still no, almost no change in the pH, but when you get down to the uh, St. Thomas and you're just below seven pH, so 
that's typically when you'd want to go ahead and redose actually uh, your your blood cardioplegia at that maximum 30 minute mark. But taking it all the way out here to the uh, two hour mark, which we uh, kind of recommend a, a second dose for custodial, you're still just under a pH of, of uh, 7.0. So the heart is, uh, is protected uh, because of the buffering capacity of the histidine. And if you could appreciate there was 198 millimoles of histidine, our blood, which you know also helps buffer, has, a, has two millimoles of histidine. So uh, quite a difference there. So then you get to the T of the HTK tryptophan, and that's just a membrane stabilizer and anchoring protein. And that facilitates the uh, transition of the sodium and calcium ions in and out of the cell for, for, uh, for very quick action. So when you take the clamp off, the custodial, again, is still in the uh, microvasculature, and it'll help transport that sodium back in. And you typically see a quicker uh, normal sinus rhythm uh, than you, you would uh, you're used to seeing with typical blood cardioplegia. And then the key to glutarate, obviously it's, it's the energy source. It's there for the uh, post ischemic phase, uh, just like giving a hot shot. So that's why it's often unnecessary to give a hot shot because you already have the, uh, the advantages of having the key to glutarate in the microvasculature already for when you take the clamp off. And then mannitol, if I know I went over it quickly, but we have a pretty high dose of mannitol in um, custodial. And as purported in cardiopulmonary bypass, the third edition, its greatest effect is at the beginning of an ischemic insult. So what a better time to have a high dose of mannitol in your myocardial protection solution than at the very beginning, um, because we're, we're creating ischemic insult when, we, insult when we put that cross clamp on. And it's also another oxygen free radical. So um, we have the that same scenario of, of uh, protecting the heart over and over. And it also has some renal protective uh, qualities as well whenever uh, it's reinduced systemically back into the system. So let's jump into the how we deliver it. And this picture uh, is just your basic coil and, and bucket and a system that uh, a lot of us are, are familiar with and have used in the past. And I put that there because it's really, that's all you, would typically need to, uh, to deliver custodial HTK. And I'd like to mention that it's unnecessary to adjust how you, what kind of uh, equipment that you use. So you could use your standard four to one ratio. You could use your Quest system. It's, it's, it's adaptable to whatever you're using. So there's never any kind of capital um, cost associated with uh, using custodial for your clinical cases. So going over the protocol, it must be stored. Uh, refrigerated, so um, has to be kept cold. And then, like I said, any kind of standard cardioplegia ratio set can be used. And we deliver custodial at three to four degrees Celsius, um, like most cardioplegias. And we give that at 20 millimeters per kilogram, at a maximum of two liters for the initial dose. And this is the, for adults, obviously. And then subsequent doses are delivered at the same temperature for half of the loading dose. Initially, custodial, we deliver it at 125 millimeters of mercury until we get an electrical arrest. And then we'll typically back that off to an infusion rate of about 80 millimeters of mercury for five or six minutes. And of note here, it's more important that the rate and time are correct as, as opposed to the total volume. So we're not just shooting for um, two liters even. We're, we're real concerned with the, uh, the rate and time. And then common sense, make sure that the heart's not distended so that you get really nice even distribution of the uh, uh, custodial throughout the myocardium. And then, like I said earlier, recommend between 90 and 20 minutes, a subsequent dose might be necessary. So you know, you get to the, the two hour mark and, and decide where you're at in the procedure. And uh, if you at, if you need to give a uh, another dose, and if you do have to redose, if you've got quite a bit of work left to do and you redose, you are resetting the clock back to another two hours. So it's, unless you're in a really, really difficult case, it's unlikely that you'd ever give more than two doses of custodial for an entire procedure. <laughs> And then continuous uh, hemoconcentration, Z-buffing, 
um, is probably necessary if you don't vent it, but we recommend venting whenever possible um, through the right atrium. So some of the benefits, low viscosity for improved flow rates throughout the microvasculature. It allows for rapid cooling of the myocardium. Reduced potassium levels allows for quick release without any harmful effects, especially to the kidneys. There's no, no kidney load of that high potassium. It's got superior buffering when compared to blood. We went over that. And there's one recognized protocol. So you should expect to see the same results every time because you're doing it exactly the same way every time. It's not varied for procedure or surgeon. And then there's no additives necessary. So no compounding whatsoever. So if you get an emergency, you pull it from the refrigerator, hang it and go. And then retrogrades often unnecessary because it protects the, the right heart so well. Some of the challenges, hemodilution is obviously a challenge. This is a 100% crystalloid cardioplegia solution. So uh, we recommend, like I said earlier, scavenging whenever possible. And then hyponatremia. Um, so you will see low sodiums if you, if you do not scavenge. And you could treat that or not treat it. It will resolve naturally without any intervention. So it, it's not harmful to treat it or to not treat it. So I want to change gears and look at the, that challenge of hemodilution um, for the rest of the talk. So hemodilution, we're giving 100% cardioplegia, so it, it, it sounds like it, it should be, uh, hemodilution should be an issue. But when you look at this paper that uh, Stammers and his team put out, um, looking at all the different protection strategies, it really doesn't seem to matter um, what the uh, chromatocrits are, how much blood products are used. Typically, uh, if, you, if you look at the hematocrit, the custodial group is actually slightly higher, not statistically significant, but slightly higher. And, and I think that's because we use ultrafiltration to optimize every patient. So we're not selectively deciding which patient we should uh, optimize their uh, hematocrit. But does that mean we're done with it? I should stop right there. No, there's still a, a lot of work left to be done. And this paper uh, proves that point. The group out of the uh, this cardiovascular anesthesiology clinical practice improvement group, they note here that over the last decade with all the, advan um, all the strides we made in blood conservation, that our high risk patients are still, 50% of them are still getting blood products. So there's still a lot of work left to be done here. And some of the recommendations that they uh, gave for perfusion in particular were minimizing bypass circuits. I think we're all doing that. Um, wrapping in some form, um, and that is often very much utilized. But this last one, modified ultrafiltration, I think this is where we could, uh, you know, dig in a little deeper here because it's not as widely used for the adult population. And when they did a retrospective study um, of 573 patients, they did note that these patients uh, did re have reduced inflammatory mediators and um, had lower uh, transfusion requirements as compared to the uh, non-modified ultrafiltration group. And this study put out by Zakhar and his team in the uh, thoracic surgery annual show the exact same thing with uh, adult cardiac uh, modified ultrafiltration showing a, a decrease in inflammatory uh, mediators as well as reducing uh, blood product and transfusions and showing some improvement in cardiac output index and systemic vascular resistance. So there is proof that this does work out there, but again, don't, I don't often see it in everyday practices. And then this our, our folks here at uh, perfusion.com, thank you very much for keeping us uh, informed. This was just put out by anesthesia. And, and uh, at this critical time during this pandemic, uh, now more than ever that we should use some common sense principles to blood management and, and do what we can to uh, reduce the uh, risk of transfusions because we really don't know if uh, this virus is transmitted through potential donors. So. Um, we should be doing all we can. So what can we do? Well, I, I think EMUF is, is kind of some low hanging fruit. I think this is an, an opportunity for us to explore this a little bit more and, and do some more pr um, prospective studies to, uh, 
to help prove that this could be a, a source of reducing blood product usage in our patient population. What is EMUF? Well, it's basically um, extracorporeal modified ultrafiltration. Sometimes it's known as offline MUF and it's been around for a very long time and, and most of us have seen it um, occasionally or have tried, you know, single pass modified ultrafiltration and giving whole blood back. But this is the process of multi-pass ultrafiltration of your cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. And there's what the circuit looks like. But why should we EMUF? Well, it improves the pace post bypass hematocrit, and that's pretty obvious. And it also improves hemostasis. We're saving uh, the patient's viable platelets. We're preserving their clotting factors. And end of the day, it is the patient's own whole blood. So we're giving back exactly what was uh, in the uh, patient prior to separating from cardiopulmonary bypass. So hemobag is a way that you could do that uh, EMUF. And it's been around. E it's been around for quite some time, but uh, it, I think it's a good time to reintroduce it back into the uh, back into the picture and uh, taking a look at the uh, circuit. It's a, it's a very simple circuit. It's here. It is. It's a it's a separate system that you you put into your existing cardiopulmonary circuit. It's one sterile circuit and allows you to do a controlled multi-pass uh, hemofiltration of your circuit. And, and give back a, a high quality product. And so I think it's, it's one of the solutions that we should uh, start investigating using. And that, here's some of the clinical data that was put out by uh, Ross's team out there in uh, Salem, Oregon and showing in increased hematocrits. You can see that up eight points, improving the uh, platelet counts and improving fibrinogen and lowering the uh, PTT and INR. So it's, they showed that they gave this high quality product back to the patient. And then the group from Pittsburgh also demonstrating preserving all these clotting factors that are so important at a time when the patient needs it most, when we're, you know, off bypass and given protamine and trying to uh, uh, produce hemostasis. So I think this is a great system. And I think here's some of the reasons I, I feel we should consider hemobag for the EMUF process. It just standardizes the whole process. Um, we've all been there. We've tried to, if we tried to do some some type of EMUF, we've cut and spliced our circuit and, and tried to uh, make a circuit multi-pass, but it, it becomes very arduous and, and confusing and this standardizes it. So it reduces the operator error and you get reproducible, reproducible results. So you're gonna see the same results every time when you use the exact same circuit. It reduces the risk of infection. You've got one sterile kit. You just insert the kit and start processing. And I've seen this in action. It enhances the team approach to blood conservation because you've got the, the surgeons and anesthesia all actively engaged in um, providing the patient with a whole blood post cardiopulmonary bypass. So with that, I want to uh, thank everybody. Um, if you have any clinical questions whatsoever, there is my email, wnacotra at essentialpharma.com. And with that, I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gnaiden and Kevin McCusker. They've been uh, conducting research for over 25 years together. And today they're gonna be uh, showing some of their uh, latest findings. Opportunity for us all to get together and share with us a week uh, a couple of days of of science and perfusion, uh, so we're looking forward to that. And I'd also like to thank the Perfusion.com team for all the effort they've put into making this happen. Uh, having been involved in the prep work up to this point, it's really shocking to see how much work the their whole team, Brian and his per, per team at Perfusion.com, puts into this. So it really is extraordinary. So. Um, we do have a lot of information here to get across this morning. Um, we will be uh, tight for time. So as my Monsignor says at Mass uh, on Sundays, let us begin. So we want to continue the research that we've talked about in several of the other Sanibel meetings. Um, and our title for today is going to be Myocardial Preservation by Single-Shot Cardioplegic Techniques. So we've been at this game 
I personally, from in the field for 32 years, uh, we've done an, a lot of research in uh, looking at leukofiltration, biocompatible coatings, um, circuit modifications, uh, so much so developing the circuit um, for under 800 mLs, uh, where we've titled everything a condensed circuitry, never mentioning in any of our publications about mini bypass because we haven't miniaturized anything. Uh, we've condensed the circuitry to go ahead and use those products that are offered by our manufacturers, but all the pathways and how we go ahead and we utilize them. The other part of the stuff that the uh, IP that we've patented is also in microplegia. So when the single dose corneoplegic solutions came in uh, and were being offered in our armamentarium, uh, we felt obliged to go ahead and open up laboratories and uh, gather some clinical data as well and go ahead and start publishing about this. So our topic today is going to be myocardial preservation by single shot corneoplegic technique. We have no conflicts of interest. All studies here uh, that we are going to mention are our own work, um, and we are performed in an independent setting. Um, we do want to highlight that uh, my research partner, Professor Canadian, is now the chair at Anchor City Hospital campus, quite proudly, and it's a new facility. And yes, those numbers underneath are actually correct. There are 3,804 hospital beds. There are 675 ICUs and 128 ORs. It's one of the largest medical centers in the world. Um, it's about the size of several shopping malls in this country. So quite, quite, quite large. So our outline here is concept of myocardial protection, single dose solutions, um, recent research we want to cover. And we've gone over our projects, experimental, clinical, and we'll finish with some nuclear imaging uh, work that we've done for um, studies looking at these hearts that have received these types of solutions 30 days out. So when we start with uh, any point of research, we go ahead and look at how, with the amount of literature that's out there uh, for us to go ahead and work our way through. So within cardiac surgery to date, there's over 402 uh, 100,000 publications, uh, close to 21,000 on the pediatric and myocardial protections, about 13,000. Myocardial preservation, about 5,000 under that topic. And about 16,000 publications in cardiac region. Um, fewer in cold, warm, crystalloid uh, myocardial techniques, you know, publications in retrograde and meantograde techniques. But very little data is out there about these single dose solutions. So, start to talk about that. So, the single dose solution that we're all most familiar with, which is uh, uh, presented and talked about quite a bit, is Dr. Pedro Del Nido's solution. Dr. Del Nido is a pediatric heart surgeon at a Boston Children's uh, Hospital. Um, he had a patented solution that is now available to everyone that patent has run out. And uh, it was developed for his pediatric patients. Um, so within that cocktail, we take a one liter bag of plasmolite A, that's their base solution, and they're gonna go ahead and add the following. So it's 16.3 mLs of mannitol, 20%, 50% magnesium sulfate, four mLs, so about four milligrams. Sodium bicarbonate, 8.4%, 13 mLs, um, 13 mLs of uh, potassium chloride, so that equals about 26 MEQs in that cocktail and 13 mLs of lidocaine 1%. Uh, the delivery is in a, the mix is four to one crystalloid with blood. Multiple centers do give eight to one or further out on that. Um, and the calculation is to give about 20 mLs per kilo at eight to 12 uh, degrees, but no more than one liter. And, you know, they do say repeat only if the cross client time is greater than three hours or electrical activity at the surgeon discretion. Well, the bulk of centers where we, we are involved when we use it, they pretty much go about one hour out before redosing. Some centers we can talk about go 90 minutes. Um, and uh, I would like to hear from other centers that go further out and would love to go ahead and analyze uh, what's happening there. So the idea behind this is the 
that, that it will reduce the energy consumption uh, for the heart. It blocks calcium flux into the cells. It will go ahead and as far as hydrogen ions, it's scavenger. Uh, it preserves high energy phosphates, promotes anaerobic glycolysis during myocardial arrest. And I put in bold here, it does not keep the heart cold. I was just recently in a large medical center. Uh, we were sharing our data with that at Grand Rounds. Had the opportunity to go into their ORs, four separate ORs, and um, all they were using Del Nido, and went into four. There was not a heart uh, based upon. We could quickly look at the TEE because they were not using myocardial temperature probes, but based upon the TEE temps, there wasn't a heart that was cold on 32 degrees. So that's that is a concern. So um, Dr. Del Nido does not suggest that any of this be involved um, for the adult population. Remember, he's operating strictly on pediatrics at Boston Children's. He cools all his patients to 22 degrees. And to date, um, you know, in our publications, we've written that there's greater than 200 different modifications of this, but we're probably getting data back for almost up to 300 different modifications of Del Nido. So everybody has their own formula for this. It's a breakdown. A lot of people um, taking away the plasma one liter bag of plasma light A and mixing it either in with the Quest system or in a uh, syringe system and using an algorithm to go ahead and give that directly into the heart. But the lidocaine is the very Lidocaine dose is a very important part of this. So the other single dose solution is HDK, the histidine ketoglutarate the tryptophan. This thing was, is designed for that acidosis anaerobic long ischemia time. The ketoglutarate is there in the solution for the ATP production during the reperfusion. And the tryptophan stabilizes the cell membrane. So the HDK, it's a sodium depletion of the extracellular spaces. And that causes a hypopolarization of the monocyte plasma membrane, inducing cardiac arrest in diastole. Coronary distribution through retrograde, hemodilution, transfusion it is a concern, is a concern, but it's not a concern if you can modify it. Lidocaine dosing dilemma, data on limited population and limited clinical parameters, which are studied. No data on long-term outcome other than what we have published. And the cost, it's very inexpensive to do now. These are things that we readily can pull from a Pixis and mix. But HTK, the histidine, tryptophan, and ketoglutarate formula, pediatric, uh, used for both pediatric and adults, single formula, is satisfactory evidence in the adult valve and uh, um, many types of surgery. And coronary distribution for retrograde hemodilution transfusion. There is talk about a sodium dilemma. Um, but through hemoconcentration, um, th this is quite uh, something that can be corrected quite easily. And there's data on a limited population, limited clinical parameters of study, and there's no data on long-term outcomes other than what we have published for 30 days. And, uh, you know, at this particular point, it is, there is a cost associated with that. So questions, questions we break down through these single dose solutions. Which patients do we choose? Pediatric adults, which types of surgery? Pediatric adult valve, adult cabbage, outcome of the myocardial protection, early postoperative war. So well, then now start to look into where our research states. So the current literature, always equivalent and or better early outcome than conventional techniques in pediatric populations, is what it's stating. Mostly equivalent and or early outcome than conventional techniques in adult valve surgery. Conflicting data on a limited amount of adult cabbage population. And there's very limited, limited parameter studies through troponin levels, temperature, et cetera, and no data on long outcomes. So specialty care had recently uh, published a paper, which we thought was interesting. The fact that when they flipped that um, for cabbage AVR, MVR, um, in the cabbage uh, AVR form, it appears that uh, a greater percentage of that the teams would reach than for the HTK solution. And um, another publication from that team 
It's also showing, and in, in when we talk about transfusion or hemodilution effects, is that there is slightly more in the del nido as opposed to the HDK, uh, but relatively close. So our projects, which are experiments, and we've published, so we have, as we spoke before, we have several laboratories where we can go ahead and do this, and we have large clinical sites where we can gather a lot of patients in a short period of time. So, um, so we we focused on a direct cellular effect of different cardiac solutions, and we've documented them long term, and that we believe uh, are most underestimated facts about cardioplegia topics in the literature. So we presented this in 2018 at the Heart Valve Society, and we went ahead and looked at a long-term protective effects of single multi-dose cardioplegic solutions in cell culture model. So we went ahead and we gathered three types of cells. We, um, we pulled from uh, neonatal, cells, those are the H9C2 cells. We pulled uh, myofibroblasts, which are L929 cells, and um, the adult cells are the UVEC cells, the human umbilical vein endothelium cells. So what we did is we did cell viability um, with MTT proliferation assay. Um, and that takes time to do the MTT proliferation assay. We did that until 48 hours, and we did membrane integrity um, studying through the LDH studies, and we did we continued those for 24 hours. And you know, people said, "Well, it, we're about got probably probably your research would have gone a lot quicker if you used the MTS proliferation assay as opposed to MTT." But with MTS um, is probably a little bit more uh, colometric interference that goes there. So we wanted to get true, uh, uh, good imaging, good sampling, so we stuck for the long-term MTT. Um, so um, the, of that study, our aim was to test single-dose cardioplegic solutions compared to conventional based on cell viability, cell integrity uh, versus time. Let's go ahead and we wanted to demonstrate long-term myocardial protection. So cell viability, MTT analysis with respect to time until 48 hours, cell membrane integrity, functional evaluation with the LDH test until 24 hours. Also, we needed to underline the answers to the questions. Is it acting better on pediatric adult or the myocardial cell? So we went ahead and we took 96 wells, right? So um, we looked at the L29s, which were the myofibroblasts, the human umbilical vein. We believe we've lost audio. Yeah. Vein endothelial cells and the primary neonatal cardiomyocytes. And we use Del Nido. We put them in, uh, as I said, 96 wells of Del Nido, HDK, blood, and St. Thomas. We had a baseline temp of 34 degrees for two hours of 32, six hours of 36, 24, 36 and 48 hours, 36. So what were findings in those cell cultures? So when we look at the data that we retrieved from the L929 cell culture and the fibromyoblast, and looking at the viability studies, you can see two hours, six hours, it starts, things start to change early on in the six hours. And um, 24, we start to see the HDA climb and really in the 48 hour the HTK solution uh, outperforms the Del Nido, Pledgesol, blood and Pledgesol in the control. And we go ahead and we look at the uh, HUVEC, the human vein and filial uh, cells culture. And these are adult endothelial cells um, to six hours relatively close, start to see the change again in the viability studies. Uh, in the HTK solution, and the longer uh, we go out to the 48 hour point, really start to see a difference there. Um, but here, like we figured what we would find, 
in the primary neonatal cardiomyocytes. Those are the H9C2 cell cultures. And in these viability studies, the two hours, six hours, um, 24, um, HTK and Del Nido relatively same. And then uh, long-term in the 48 hours, it goes out where the Del Nido, the viability uh, outperforms um, the HTK. So when we look at the percent for cellular uh, disintegration, we want to do the LDH cytotoxicity test. So in this cell membrane integrity, it's a functional evaluation. So um, here, uh, all relatively close, start to see changes. Um, this is uh, in the L929. Uh, in the uh, H9C2, um, we start to see less uh, cellular disintegration um, with the HTK as opposed to the Del Nido, also in the UVEC and the L929. So other studies that we did then, we go ahead and we put things under the electron microscope and we'll do a fluorescent microscopy imaging. And we'll use acridine orange and propidium iodine staining to get uh, these colors that we're gonna show you here. And we go ahead and look through these slides. Um, the red orange colors are non-viable cells and the green fluorescents are those viable cells. So you see what our control is, uh, plegisol, um, does not perform well in these studies, um, blood and plegisol, but you can see the HTK um, is a very vibrant fluorescent. There are many viable cells there, as is the Del Nido, but HTK uh, performs there. So when we do the microscopy imaging for the H9C2 and those primary neonatal cardiomyocytes, and we did this imaging at 24 hours. Um, you can go ahead and you can see how vibrant it is in the HTK in the Del Nido. So the other thing we want to talk about, you know, there's, you'll start to see more in the literature, and we've started to analyze this in our laboratories, is microvascular integrity, glycocalyx. So what is glycocalyx? Glycocalyx is, uh, it's a, it's a pericellular matrix. It's a glycolipid. It's a glycoprotein. Um, it's within all human beings. It's in all animals, fish. Um, you know, as if we've probably, hopefully, we've all caught fish in our lifetimes. And when you hold the fish and you start to rub your hands across it, you can feel that slime that's there. Well, that's the glycocalyx. Um, we're doing multiple studies on this, but. Um, this is a, a study, some of that research, and we presented it uh, about last year at the Academy meeting. So we titled this Safety Dilemma of Long-Term Protection of Del Nido, HTK Cardioplegia, and Minimally Invasive Valve Surgery, Clinical Impact on Microvascular Integrity, confirmed by the uh, our cell uh, culture data. And what were the results there? Well, the results, there wasn't a significant difference among the groups with respect to demographic data, BMI, and change in the troponin 1 levels at T1 or T2. But there was early perioperative data, which we, uh, we demonstrated all three types of the cardioplegia techniques provided effective clinical outcome with similar effects on blood biochemical parameters. So the cross cut time in that group one uh, was 72 minutes, group two, 69, and 66, a lot less shedding of the endothelial of glycocalyx. So we want to show you those imaging of what that means and you know, put them under the electron microscope and you get the imaging. So you can start to see the shedding more here, the breakdown of tissue uh, in that endothelial uh, tissue, HDK and Del Nido. And here, these are the microscopy. So thing you want to look at is the more brilliant color of the red um, is more shedding that's occurring. So um, here, the, the upper portion here would be the HTK. Uh, the mid-level is the Del Nido and the St. Thomas at, at the bottom. So less shedding in the HTK. Uh, very similar, uh, if a little bit more in the Del Nido and far more in that St. Thomas solution. So um, our projects, some clinical data that we want to talk about. Um, I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, 
can you hear me? I'm going to continue. And so I'm going to talk about the clinical outcomes uh, of our studies when we compare different single shot cardioplegic techniques. And so we started with the uh, long-term effects of cardioplegic techniques in the early studies. And we compared about 100 patients from each group, like St. Thomas is controlled, blood cardioplegia 4 to 1, then need on HTK. So um, we evaluated the patients in the ICU until they are discharged. And after discharge, we follow up the patients up to one month and three months. So um, in the early postoperative period, there was not any significant difference with respect to any clinical parameters, even in those 100 patients in each group. Um, so with respect to the enzyme levels or length of ICU stay or inotropic support or whatever. So after the operation, we just... Um, just fixed some kind of um, inappropriate signs, let's say, to follow up in the early postoperative period that shows us a good idea about the myocardial preservation. So we um, fixed that if the patient has a kind of tachycardia or 100 uh, beats per minute or bradycardia or arrhythmia or some kind of um, problems, uh, symptoms like shortness of breath or edema or some signs of heart failure, this will show us the uh, inappropriate or let's say not sufficient um, kind of myocardial preservation. So we use a LifeWatch mobile system. It's a telemetry system. It's a very um, small um, machine like an iPhone. You connect it to the patient like this. And then this monitors all the parameters of the patients for 24 seven. And we just demonstrated all those data in a live fashion. So if anything, um, any, any problem is occurs, then we receive an SMS message and then we can interfere with, with the treatment of the patients at the same time. So we have the data like this, uh, data sheets, um, like measuring every time the blood pressure, arrhythmia, or any kind of um, parameters in the early post period. So when we check this data, we can follow up only 78% of the patients we've done, like the, as you remember, 100 patients in each group. So in the 30-day um, follow-up, um, the HDK group was uh, very much satisfactory, and especially less incidence of tachycardia or bradycardia, and some less incidence of diagnostic symptoms. So at the third month follow-up, we could only follow up half of the patients, and when we checked of that, um, the incidence of tachycardia and bradycardia, um, the diagnostic symptoms were significantly more in the Dalmido group. So this was the initial study to show us the long-term uh, follow-up of the patients receiving different types of cardioplegia. Another um, um, research topic was to test those signal, those techniques in minimally invasive surgery. As you know, it, they are becoming more and more um, popular in the minimally invasive surgery area. So we compared again those four solutions. Um, again, in the early perioperative period, we didn't demonstrate any significant difference with respect to any clinical parameters like this, like cross lamp, ventricular defibrillation rate, length of ICU stay or neontropic support, etc. But again, in the 30 day follow up, again, we have arrhythmia problem in the Del Nido group, especially in the long term. And, and then we just continued to do research on the single dose techniques. And one other concern was to uh, was the hemodilution. So we compared the hemodilution effect of those um, groups with respect to control groups. And the primary endpoint was to, to understand the perioperative transfusion of allogenic red blood cells, or secondary endpoint was the hematocrit change. So in those types of groups, when you use single those cardioplegic techniques in our clinical practice, we always use ultrafiltration at the end of the operation. So um, the, the volume, so these are all very uh, long lasting operations with the cross clamp time of about one, one, one and a half hour or something like that, 90 minutes or more. So when you deliver St. Thomas every 20 minutes, then it becomes again, the same volume that you give in the single dose technique. So there was not, any significant volume difference with respect to different cardioplegic techniques in that, that group. And we, as I told you, um, we always perform ultrafiltration with those single dose techniques. 
And at the end of the operations, in the clinical period, in the early clinical period, there is not any significant difference with respect to hemodilution if you perform ultrafiltration with the single dose techniques. And this is the follow up of the patients from the baseline up to discharge. So, um, if I believe if we use proper techniques to follow up those single dose techniques, there is no problem of hemodilution. So, um, we also have some imaging techniques. So there is um, very uh, important radio pharmaceutical. It's called iodine 123 uh, MIVG. This shows us the innervation capacity of the heart. It's a technique that we always use to follow up transplant patients. But in this uh, study, we just follow up these single dose cardioplegic techniques in the long term to understand if there is a kind of innervation perfusion defect. Because if there is an innervation perfusion mismatch, that means arrhythmia in the early postoperative period. So at it, 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 the first two lines, you see the MIBG level and tallium level. One shows the perfusion, the other shows the innervation. So the, um, the figure ups is the down needle and down is the HDK. So as soon as we just follow up those patients for 50 patients in each group, we demonstrate that perfusion innervation mismatch, which may cause very uh, serious arrhythmic problems in the postoperative period. And also, um, as my colleague told before, we just focused on endothelial glycocalyx and aquaporin levels. So aquaporins are new biomarkers that shows us the uh, handling capacity of, of a cell to deal with the uh, water content or volume content. So when a cell um, confronts with a high volume overload, it then produces aquaporin molecules to handle this. If it's over the capacity, then the cell cannot produce aquaporins and the cell failure and cell destruction occurs. So uh, we compared, again, three different groups at that time, single techniques, course versus controls, and Thomas. And we also um, created another group that we um, include the repeated dose of cardioplegic techniques because you know, this becomes another problem. For example, in our clinical practice, when we use HDK, we can go up to two hours, but when I use the needle, I always want to give a redose after one hour. So we also try to understand the impact of this additional dose because they are additional volumes. And at the end of this, again, we have the same uh, format to do ultrafiltration at the end of every operation. But this is a very important clinical level because for the first time, we can see some kind of differences in the early postoperative period. So when you give a repeated dose of the cardioplegic techniques, you have more problem. So you have more trans blood transfusion as expected, and you have um, a worse cerebral desaturation as expected, and you may have more significant, the more low cardiac output. And also, we just check for the aquaporin content. And in the Del Nido group, in the repeated uh, subgroup, so handling with this volume overload was not satisfactory and significantly the worst with respect to other control groups. And this is the microscopic image that we take from the uh, right uh, atrium biopsies. So um, the upper level, and of course, you can see the, uh, the edema in the cell on the right hand side, right up and in comparatively a better one in the right lower pictures. So as a conclusion of this um, last study, we say, okay, myocardial problem preservation is a very important issue, but it's not the problem that we operate the patient. We kept, keep them like five days to seven days in the hospital and we discharge them and the problem is over. Because um, we don't know anything in the long term what happens to those patients and there are still many concerns and many questions about the redosing and, and the additional volume overload and how those cells are dealing with this um, hemodilution. So um, it's an ongoing topic and we're going on our clinical research and um, this because myocardial preservation is still a concept without clear and specific clinical signs and every unit is having their own protocol, own formulas so it's a really um, very interesting area for debate. So thank you very much. And we are ready to receive the questions. Thank you.